Hello everyone and welcome to the Talk Music Podcast. My name is Scott Cowie. I am the Universal Drum Champion of Cambridge. You know about this, don't you? He knows all about it. Ted McKenna knows. It's Ted McKenna. He's back for the third time. It's the trilogy, ladies and gentlemen. Very special. We thought we'd go visual because making his debut on the podcast too. The legend, the one and only, the unique... The sin dog himself, the sensational Sal Clemenson. Give it up. Give it up for whenever you're watching this. And uh, the guys are going to talk about everything that there is to talk about music. Here we go. Woo! Question number one. What advice would you give to musicians that are in a situation where their singer wants to go on stage dressed as Adolf Hitler and or Jesus Christ? But well, you know, Andy, it's been in that situation before. Yes, yeah, funnily enough, I yeah. remember some. Uh, I would board. welcome them aboard. Does that ring a bell with, with open arms? Yeah. <laughs> yes, it does ring. A, it rings a big bell. You know what I'm talking about, then. I think you're talking about perhaps Alex. Yeah. Mm. Well, yeah, that was just his interpretation of a great song um, that he wanted to develop. Frame the song, framed, which is um, which is a great a great message. We spoke it earlier on, but the first thing, the first incarnation was the kind of. Um, the thug, the, hoog, the, hool, the hooligan, the kind of, um, you know, on the waterfront kind of character, Leather misunderstood. Yeah. You know, I was framed, I was framed, I did do nothing, you know, I was fucking framed, you know what I mean? Mm. And, um, and so it just, he, he just kept that going, he just developed it into these characters. And I think he saw something humorous in the idea, the irony we spoke mm. of earlier on, of saying, well, anybody could possibly, well, the point that Ted made earlier was that anybody could actually be framed. Mm. So to say, well, Hitler was framed, uh, Jesus was framed, you know. Um, it'd be quite easy to, to actually um, endorse that. Or they were way. framed by, they were they're framed in time and, and the yeah. contrast that Alex made was between somebody who's framed in, in, in a dark way as, as Hitler and, and Christ as a, as a, a you know, a saviour and a... Misunderstood. You know, again, so you, you know. but, but the whole point is that um, what's built around that is, is uh, they, they can't get out of time, as it were. Mm-hmm. They're, they're stuck in time as for what they were doing. <laughs> and you can say, I was afraid. I didn't mean it to go like this, you know. <laughs> I mean, I, you can look at it different, in different ways, but I mean, yeah, essentially, a, once, you, a, once you open your mouth and say what you want to do, then there's no getting out of it, you know. It's a dangerous area to be in, mm-hmm. to go into that sort of thing. But Alex had a, a passion for... He was prepared to take it on, yeah for stepping up above and putting his head above the parapet, as we said, and, 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 and create a reaction and get people to think about stuff and get people to really, you know, don't piss in the water supply. Yeah, that's not a fucking bad idea. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And don't buy any bullets. Don't make any bullets. Look where, the fuck, look where we are right now on the planet. Mm-hmm. You know I, know, I know it sounds a rather simplistic and naive uh, message to get across. It's all, oh, peace and love. Yeah, 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 blah, blah, blah. But, you know. That's what we're left with. That's what we're left with. That's what we've got. Yeah, exactly. We're still, we're still I mean, dealing with that shit. In America, there's more guns than people. You know, and what are we going to do? Stop making guns? Keep killing them. You know, we do. St- I mean, there'll only be one gun left. Yeah. There'll be a gun and a person, and it'll be a kind of a standoff. A bit like Westworld. Mm-hmm. You know, there'll be some sort of scenario you could create. There's a blue song. Where the gun has intelligence, an intelligent gun. If there was a point in time in the sensation Alex Harvey band when you look back and you could pinpoint. Was there a moment when you thought, do you know what, we really wanted something here, be it you were in the studio, a live thing, is there anything you could think about? We'll start with yourself, Sam. It was almost the moment we kind of, we kind of met Alex face to face in terms of putting the whole thing together. Because we pr- previously we'd been sort of, there's a collaboration going on between Tear Gas and, and Alex's management and um, it was obviously clear that he was looking for a band. And it was kind of clear that we weren't really heading anywhere without perhaps getting the right singer. So that's dead right. We arranged this kind of. There was a gig arranged at the Marquee when Tear Gas supported Alex. Or okay, I think that was what it was. And he had a band called Giant Moth. Right. Was that Giant Moth? That oh, was Giant Moth. All right. right. And, I've, uh, I've seen Giant Moth. <laughs> and they were dreadful. They were awful. And 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 we were waiting. You know, we'd, we'd done our gig in, in Alex. But the thing about that is, I, I saw in Alex, I saw oh. something. I saw something. I could see he wanted to be... He was fantastic. He had something to put across. He wanted to do something progressive. He wanted to be mm-hmm. be kind of very much a, a, a kind of a... Almost the theatrical thing you could spot in him right away. Anyway, we got together at Burns' house and he came up to Glasgow and we were all sitting there waiting for him to arrive and he came up, came up with his uh, guitar in his hand. 
And we had a little rehearsal room that's actually survived with it. Thor. Was. Thor. Yeah, it, became, it became, it became right. Thor. It was up in somewhere. Yeah, it was owned by Paddy Burgos. Ah. So we'd arranged a little rehearsal room up there and um, we were plugged in, we had set up. Alex came in, plugged his guitar in. And he started playing the riff from Midnight Moses. Very clever. He just plays the, played the riff and he says, he turns around to us, he says, can you guys play this? And we all sort of looked at each other and went, uh, yeah, yeah, we'll <laughs> play that. And we just beat the shit out of it, basically. And he was bouncing up and down, Alex. He had a pair of big brothel creepers on. And I just remember this. He was play As we were playing that riff, he was just bouncing up and down and just looking around the band. And he was just had that grin that he has, that smile on his face. And he could just sense, he says, I could just sense right then that there was some chemistry going on. There was something that just gelled at that mm. moment. He looked as if he was, he'd found his, the band, you know, he'd found what he was after. And it took us a wee bit of time to realise quite what Alex was about and quite where he was wanting to go musically and, and stuff mm. like that. But that initial spark, I think, came about just at that. For me, that's when I noticed that, yeah, this can work. Hello? That's my banker. Yeah. Oh, um, my share, I, my shares are totally, going down, I, man. I totally agree with that. I told them not to phone me if my shares had gone down. I'm going to have to sell a house. <laughs> I totally agree. Oh. Did you feel the same then? No, that, but that, that was the moment. But when looking back, what I thought was really interesting was that um, I think it was a very clever move of Alex to do that because that's quite a, a, a difficult riff to play. People, you know, when they first hear it, it's actually quite... Uh, I'm surprised at that. I know. Because, people and I think that. I think that he, he probably whether he did or not, I think he probably thought this will appear uh, will appeal to the band's sense of oh that's interesting. How does that go? You know, it's like because bam 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 how does it go? You have to play it three times to get around the sequence because it's, you know. Hey! 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 Oh, there you are, there it is. It's all Well, that was, I don't remember doing it that way, it's but that's the blues version. That's the blues version. Yeah. But, 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 but it's a clever riff, you know. I know people uh, have often said that to me, they, uh, they're quite bemused by it at times. Yeah. I think, really? Mm -hmm. it, I know what you're saying, it feels like it almost goes on one... It, well, it, it's because it's played across the time, and, mm -hmm. and although it keeps in time, it's, it's, it's kind of going over, I think, it, I think it's, it's three times you play the riff, mm -hmm. which is, is... And then it resolves, it resolves on a funny... Yeah. Yeah. But that's very technical, you're, you're into the technicalities. It's a ten, so. It's a ten beat riff, so it, it, never even knew I could play that. So te three tens is thirty, and then we do two <clears> bars to round it off before the song starts. Something like that. Anyway, the point is, I think that was that well, was clever about it. Two bars and then foot up in the monitor. And then foot in the monitor. Foot up in the monitor. It says that in the song yeah, It says I think that foot monitor. Look to yeah. Look to your left. Look to your right, and then it's safe to safe to play. Yeah. Alex was, I think, thirty eight. The band were circa 22 years old. Um, mm. So the relationship in that band is something that's always really interests me between the, the members of the group and, of course, Alex. Mm. Looking back, as be it friend, big brother, father figure, how do you see that relationship, or how did you see the relationship at the time? Did you see him as a big brother? Did you see him as a, a mentor? Was he all of the above? Well, before we started off, um, we played with him, and I remember thinking, vividly, seeing him and, and thinking, this guy's magical. So all of that was already done. But when we, we had a meeting, uh, we had a, me a meeting with the band and Eddie Tobin at the time, mm -hmm. to basically say, well, look, this is the situation we're in. And one of the things that we thought at the time, I, I remember thinking, well, he's, we've been told he's, he's very experienced and he's worked in London and he's got a lot of, you know, he's obviously got a lot of respect, and he's blah, blah, blah. But we were thinking, yeah, but he's a bit, you know, he's a bit older than we are, and is he going to want to play stuff that we can get into? I mean, that was the main consideration. Mm -hmm. And I and I've said this a million times. Hugh and I went to get the train afterwards, and we were sitting in the station, and I, and the, the thing I vividly remember saying to Hugh was, um, well, 
at least it'll keep the band together. Because what Eddie Tobin was basically saying was, we're spending all the money we're making, good money we make in Scotland, as we're a big, bigger name there. We spend them on, on petrol and, and, and 60 a room bed and breakfasts going down to try and get things happening in London, which is what all the bands had to do in those days. If you didn't have the work down there, you I mean you were basically it was hula hoops and toast until your next gig, or sleeping in a, a, a service, a, a, you know, what were dreadful services in those days. So my initial thought was, well, okay, it may be a learning experience. He's older than we are. He's got he's well respected. And we'll see what happens, but at least we're going to carry on. Otherwise, it was like back to Coke Bridge, back to whatever, you know, which is what any band is, is, is afraid of. When they see a light at the, t- the end of the tunnel, they don't want to have to go back and start, and yeah. start again. <clears throat> so I think we all committed to it from that basis, I, anyway. I, I had, do I just to pick up what Ted said, I'd, I'd, I'd seen Alex at the Picasso Club. I don't know if you were there that night. No, no, I wasn't. Uh, the Picasso Club was a club up Buchanan Street at that time, way back. With a club, it's a late night kind of club where bands used to hang out after they'd come back from doing their gigs they would come and all meet and there was a bit of a jam session or there'd be a band playing and it would be all kind of quite, quite loose and, that. and one night I went up <clears throat> and Alex was on with his soul band and Leslie playing guitar and some brass he had to, all the, yeah. Alex was actually playing bass and his, his brother was playing guitar and then he had a kind of brass section and that, and you know the soul thing the James Brown type soul uh, stuff that he was doing and he was singing like a soul singer. He wasn't singing like the way he sang it, Sabby. He was singing like a proper real, you know. He had that He had that voice. And I just remember watching them, and I thought, jeez, man, these guys are good. You know, they were like tight as tight. But, you know, you'd listen to you say, that's a tight band. And it was all right on the money. And I just thought, wow, this guy is great. But that was that was an experience I'd seen before we even knew that we were going to be joining forces mm, with him. Long, long this was just long before that. Mm. So when he did come along, as Ted says, as we did get when we did get together, I had that image of I knew that he was accomplished in terms mm-hmm. of what he could do and, and, and where his roots were and all of that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And and I think for me that was the connection I had with Alex. I could see that, that his musical roots were not that different. Even though he had a generation ahead of us musically and he would, he was more rockabilly, you know, and we just Hi came Williams in. And <clears throat> we like came that. in, Ted and I would come in more on the kind of Elvis, you know, at that sort of time. It was just changing over. Eddie Chuck Cochran. Berry, Eddie Chuck Cochran. Cochran. But so Alex was kind of, he was still coming from that era, you know, he was still in that era. And he'd, he'd worked always, with these guys. In, in, yeah, yeah. He'd worked with these guys in the start club. I mean... So there was a little connection there, you know, there was a, there was a, there was a, an, a, an appreciation of what it takes to, to play rock and roll, I guess. You know, the kind of noise that rock and roll is. And um, and I think that's where he, where he got his, his enthusiasm from. Because he, he would always kind of tend to lean, lean back towards that era mm-hmm. when we were writing or doing yeah. stuff, you know, certain songs, Irene. certain riffs. You know, Good night, Irene. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Things like that. And we, we thought, you know, I suppose the first thing that made us feel uh, or gave us the impression of his adventurous mm-hmm. uh, idea for a, for, a, for a statement about the fundamental thing about music, which is mm-hmm. that if it's good music, it's good music. And when we did the tango, I mean, at first, I, and I've, I've said this in interviews, <laughs> that, you know, probably Hugh and I were more kind of things, oh, yeah, we'll give a bash and that, but, but Zal and Chris are more coming from a, a progressive rock thing. And probably it was harder for them to get their head around it than it was for us, whereas... Hugh and I grew up from a background of a, a very broad musical kind of um, genres. Swing and, and, music. And we, and we fancies ourselves playing a bit of jazz fantasy. You know, we, we indulge ourselves and try to learn how to get the feel of those styles. So it was more more of an interesting thing to, to try and do it. But I could feel it right away, everybody going, what? A, t- a tango? Are you serious? What kind of rock band does that? Can you imagine like Led Zeppelin doing a tango? But then again, what did they do? They went and... and Slow Fox. They went to... Yeah, for, yeah, they went to Indian music, you know. Mm. They started using influences in, in, in scale and, and uh, modes or um, and, and, and time. They started using stuff like that that was reminiscent of Indian music. And that's how you do something different. You've got to mix the styles because everybody jumps on the same <coughs> bandwagon mm-hmm. and wants to sound a certain way. So you're, you're the not song itself, though, next the song was just what Alex wanted to do. I think he was just happy for us to to, to provide a backdrop for him, yeah. and that's really all we did. You know, <coughs> we just created a backdrop as best we could, mm. and he just wanted to put that song across. And it was, you know, it's one of the Sab's sort of iconic numbers, I guess, for lots of people. Mm. 
Um, the band were obviously so successful, lots of albums sold, sold out sold arenas up and down the country and, and beyond. Um, but for me, and putting my extreme bias aside as a big Sab fan, I think the band should have been even bigger, um, should have been even more successful. Um, and maybe, looking back, one of the great unsung bands in the, the history of time, successful as Barnard, do you guys feel that as well? Do you feel as if it could have been even bigger? Uh, I think, I'm, my, I've said this many times, I think we, we would... We would have been a lot bigger if we'd caught the wave of MTV because we were ideal for television yes. because of the, the, the visual thing and all the, the reaction to any things that the Don Kirshner show or in concert or anything that we did was immense in America. But you need more than that. The trouble is for me, and this is the way I think about it, is we could have been more successful, but I think there would be more of us dead by then. Seriously. I Seriously, because what happens with rock bands is you get young guys that just live in a wee town outside the Glasgow. I'm just call the crooks, call the crooks, call the crooks, perhaps. But I mean, but if you've grown up in that environment, and this is what's happened, you don't need, as Alex used to say, just just read the papers. There's loads of guys who come out of that background, and from going down to the shop for their mother, getting the milk in, and then going playing in the garage with the guys, they're suddenly thrust into the middle of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and all the and energy, all the clank, all the clank, clingons. And the and the mirrors, as Hugh said, we were, you know, we were hypnotised by the, or by the, the mirrors that surround us. Because everybody's telling you you're great, but if you haven't got your feet in the ground, you're dead. Yeah. That's what happens to a lot of guys in bands. And Alex said it himself mm. in his interview. He said it himself. It's like cannon for it. You go out there, and once the people realise they can make money out of you, you you're considered. It's like give them what they want. They want drugs, great. Give them give them what they want, just as long as they keep doing it, because we're going to make money. And then you don't really realise that about the industry. And most young musicians don't know about the industry before they get into it. You know, you learn, you, if you're lucky, you, you survive enough to, to learn it was a conveyor, who's making the money. It felt like a conveyor belt with Sab. You know, you were just, you were just non-stop, you know, touring, recording, writing, rehearsing. It was just, it just went on and on every day, almost, you know. We were never really happy. We were Alex, one of, one we of were Alex's, really happy. I remember one of Alex's, sort of one of Alex's, Alex's one of the things he said, he says, all right, this band, he says, you're on show 24 hours a day. I always remember him saying that. It didn't matter where you turned up, you were at an airport, if you were at, you know, whatever it was, a cafe or something. Be aware, be aware, you know, that you're on display. And we used to play up to that, you know, we used to do stuff and we used to do all sorts of, like, like bands do, that's what mm -hmm. you do, you know, it's like your ego gets hold of you and you think, yeah, I'm, I'm going to create a persona here, I'm going to run We are the greatest band in the world. You know, that's I'm going to go and do that and, and, and make myself known and, and kind of make, make, you know, inflammatory statements that people, you know, you think you've been clever and all that sort of shit. So yeah, it does, it catches hold of you and your ego just takes over and that's basically what Ted's saying, you know, you just, you become a, you, you become a serious casualty if you, if you let that happen. Mm. If there is a, a track, sorry, Ted. Sorry. No, there is a good side to it, and there's an interesting, entertaining side. But the to idea it. of being a bigger band, the, the, your, to answer, you, well, to, 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 to put a, a spin on your question, when Ted was saying about, you know, yeah, the band could have been a lot bigger, and, and lots of people say that to me, and one of my one of the bees I have in my bonnet about it all is that we that we missed a kind of a mainstream rock audience by being a little too indulgent and a little too diverse. Mm -hmm. And I've made that point quite a few times, and people are all aware of it. You know, the songs that I would pick out and say, well. Well, oh, Ted's just mentioned next. Now, next might just squeeze in for, for other reasons. It's, mm -hmm. it's got something about it. But certain other songs, I think, well, how is that going to ever appeal to it? You mentioned Led Zeppelin. Yeah. Are the Zeppelin fans going to really dig yeah. Giddy Up a Ding Dong? I don't think so. So I think we lost... The guys in the bands did. I, the, the, thing, the thing is that... Um, but that mainstream rock audience is yeah, what would have made Sab mm -hmm. bigger. In my, in, my, yeah. in my opinion. Of course it would have been. But we could have, we could have done that if we just stayed on course with Frame. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. The, the, our first agent that, said. Yeah, yeah. Just keep doing that because you know we, we were we, we were very capable of being a rock in, blues album, a rock, you know, a, capable of being a, a, our own thing. Alex's influence took us back to old blues. You know, want to just want to make love to you and things like that. Jazz, you swing. know, framed. You know, I mean, that that was a different. Set. That's not the way we were going. We were aspiring to be more in, in, in Zeppelin's direction. The thing about all the fans that I've seen worldwide is the diversity is what attracted them. To, yeah, that's you know, that's that's the other that's side paradox. of the coin. That's the paradox. Yeah, yeah because if we we'd said okay, we're we're going to do songs like this, then the record company would say great. Finally, we can put you in a pigeonhole. 
Mm-hmm. That's how it works. Mm-hmm. And the wee could have been great at that, but Alex could never have performed as a anybody else other than Alex Harvey with his mindset and his his plans for the future. But you, you, mm-hmm. you, the, you know, you can see why it would have worked in different ways, but it mm-hmm. wouldn't necessarily have worked even doing. You're right. That. I can see the cult attraction in Sab. Mm-hmm. That's it. to me. I always feel that we were a cult band. Basically, not 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 quite. You know, mm-hmm. you weren't like the headlines. Well, if you want to be it. Aerosmith, then that's different. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And exactly. they're a great band. Yeah. It's not to say you we couldn't they're have been a, a great band because we had the musicianship to be a great band in in that form formula. But I don't think Alex Alex would be capable to, you know, take it seriously because he couldn't mm-hmm. take anything seriously, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> or else unless it was everything. <laughs> if you know what I mean. You know? Yeah. Um, I get the impression mm-hmm. nice maxim. that he's, he's not the type of person that would have been told what to do by a record company. No, they pulled, well. they pulled their hair out all the time. No, no. I mean, that's a good thing. for he'll even try to go, Alex, can you not know, just wear, can you yeah. dress and put, do your hair? You know, he just thought, mm. God, why do you just turn up the same, you know, and he's like, he didn't. Like Top of the Pops. I mean, we do Top of the Pops, man. It was a nightmare. It was just a nightmare trying to, trying to blend in to the whole <laughs> thing. It was like, my God. Well, yeah, but, did yeah. you ever get some funny looks? I suppose it was a decade where... It, Always uh, get funny looks. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, I was going to say it was a decade that was so extravagant that a lot of people were for dread, but I, mm. I, I always get visions of what it must have been like when you get the clown paint and you get the tuxedo and the this and the that. Mm. Tell us about those funny looks. Tell us about those conversations backstage. Was there anything that springs to mind? The, 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 I think the, we were quite insular in that way. I think we, we had our own world. We did. We did actually have a little, Alex wanted to create this little theatre, I think is what mm. he wanted. He wanted to be the director of a little, little. it's like having, your own, it's like having your own theatre company. You know, and so he, 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 he was familiar with having worked in here and he'd done a wee bit of the West End stuff and all that and hanging around London, you know, it's all London. And um, he had this idea of, he always referred to himself as being the director of the whole thing. So I think he liked the idea of putting a show together, actually, actually putting a show and, and bringing out Every element that every, everybody in the band, he could see off stage. He used to always say that. He says, off stage, you guys are really extrovert. Mm. When you go on stage as tear gas, it's all, well, especially he saw us as tear gas, it was like fucking heads down and beating, you know what I mean? That kind of stuff, get yeah. your hair down and all that. But he saw off stage that we had rather quite, quite eccentric kind of tastes and, 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 and little kind of things that we used to get up to. <laughs> and he tried to develop, so he's, that's basically what he's looked at, and he's taken that, and he said, right, let's, let's, how do we turn that into... As any good band leader would do. A show. Take the best points, what guys, what is each individual good at, and bring it out. And, and he did it. it, that's exactly what he did. And the dressing up was kind of contemporary, but at the same time, Alex would always say to us, no, we're not glam, we're not shiny, we're not bright and, and flash. What we are is we are matte. This band is a, we have a matte finish, mm. which is a great phrase. You know, we it's more music hall. Yeah. It's not it's not glamorous. And the little and lights sparkly. Front, You know, the it's little more, space lights. Yeah. It's more caravans and car, you know, uh, carnival kind of thing. That's was yeah. Alex's impression of it, what, it, what it looked like. Is that sorts, carnival in Wales? Carnival, yes, yeah. in the valleys. <laughs> that's right. So yeah. that's uh, right off, off the point of Sab. Zal, of course, you're back, back with a vengeance. <laughs> um, ten years out, ten years screaming, wink, wink. Okay. Ten um, years screaming, yeah. Um, so tell us, for anybody that doesn't know, a lot of Sin Dogs fans, or maybe getting to know you for the, for the first time, tell us about the, the new band, the new project, the album. Well, the band came together after I spent some time in Cyprus, and I was going through a time struggling with the psychologically struggling, and I say, let's put it that way, and I was really not in a very good place. And um, yeah, just the usual stuff, you know, getting down, getting depressed and thinking, that's just something not, it's just, I need to do something about this. And I just picked a guitar up one day, a little acoustic guitar out there with me, I picked it up, started strumming about, I thought, well, let's see if there's any therapy in this, just playing music again. And I just started to get ideas, songs, lyrically, I had managed to focus on a kind of theme, lyrical theme that I felt I could say, and that's something that I felt I could sing about and speak about and that's when you, you start to feel like hey okay I've got there's your therapy right there yeah, exactly so, so you've got, I've, got some, I've got something to say you know I feel I've got something to say now so let's just get on with it mm-hmm. and it kind of snowballed I got in touch with David David Cowan the keyboard player and let's go some demos together and and, 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 and again I, I say it just it kind of it sort of snowballed from that point on was into a, a full-blown band and as you 
as you well know, you, you took pride of place behind the drum kit. Mm -hmm. And a fine uh, drummer too. A fine, oh yeah, monster drummer. A fine teacher I had. Yeah. Yeah. Here in this guy. So yeah, so it became Sin Dogs. It became a new project. And we just made all the right contacts and tried to get gigs. Mm -hmm. Got the album recorded, which was what which I've heard was a dream great. come true. What I've heard it sounds great. Yeah, I've heard some yeah, of it's heavy, the tasters heavy. that you put out. And I'm not talking about the live stuff, I've seen that as well, but the, the, one of the, 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 the tasters you put out, and I heard that right away, I just thought. Nice, no, it sounded, it sounded fabulous. To, no, it's heavy. It's, it's, it's me going back to just mm -hmm. finish off that whole thing. It's, it's me going back to what we've just been speaking about. I'm back to my roots in tear gas. I'm back to playing heavy metal rock music, which is kind of what I instinctively play the guitar. It's, it's kind of what comes to me naturally. Mm -hmm. and, and it's so it's... Sounds not a strummy guitar player. I don't like strumming about one. <laughs> strummy. It doesn't do that so much these days. I could, I could. But for a small Best session, for a small Best session fee, yeah. 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 Zala's available to do that. Okay. Okay. I can strum for a small yeah. session fee. Yeah. Mm. And of course, Ted, tell us what you're doing, Michael Schenker. You're back with him now. Well, back. It's been back a while now. But mm -hmm. tell us what you've got going on just now. Ted doesn't know. Well, um, I. Uh, you probably know I started the, with uh, Jerry McAvoy when I retired from the college, um, 2011. Uh, I kind of segued into working with uh, Jerry McAvoy. Two years ago. I got up. Well, I'd, I'd actually worked with uh, Michael in 2008 when I did a Japanese tour because he'd asked Chris and I if we would do a world tour with him. But because uh, of my commitments and because I wasn't sure where he was going, where I kind of said I, I wouldn't do it. But because um, uh, the drummer <coughs> we got after that was uh, what's his name, uh, Chris Slade. <clears throat> Chris couldn't do Japan, so I did that one. Anyway, that was just kind of isolated. So I was quite surprised when uh, Taro got in touch with me and said, Michael wants to put this thing together, which is basically his whole career, which is starting from UFO mm. through the first Michael Schenker band when Cozy Powell was in drums to when I joined, and then we did Assault Attack with Graham Bonnet. Um, then he went on to do Robin McCauley with Rob McCauley. And then he and then Doogie White latterly, so we've we've done an album. There's plans to do another album, um, and, and 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 that's all new material. But what we're doing at the moment is um, is is basically Michael's whole career, a two or forty minute set, a two and a half hours of 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 everything, and there's a lot, a lot of <laughs> great we there. Got a mic on this. Oh, well, that's 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 nice I don't know what you've got with the air then called the um, yeah so it's been it's been going it's been going great it's uh, it's it's a step back it's a, and it's contrasting with what I'm doing with um, with Jerry because that's kind of basically Rory's stuff is very individual but it's basically it's, it's in Dutch yeah, it's, it's, it's in Dutch does it <laughs> no yeah. no it'd be interesting no it would be interesting <clears throat> but I usually think those kind of things don't work do yeah, you always know. you always try and sing them in an American accent. Um, anyway, so that, that's that's where I'm at. I go to Japan in about two, you know, two of, minutes, two hours, two minutes, two hours, yeah. and then it's Brit it's Europe, Britain, and then I go back to America with Jerry, and we do another month. We're working with a guitar player out there called Davy Knowles from the Isle of Wight, who's okay. a fabulous uh, player, and he's been he lives in Chicago, and he's built up a whole thing out there, and he's got his own kind of fans and following. So this thing, he was a huge Rory fan, so mixing working with Jerry and I is a big deal for him and it's going really really well so I've got about another three three tours in America four tours America and Canada through next year as well mm -hmm. so so it's kind of it's kind of nice. ongoing but I keep reminding myself that I'm not 28 anymore or 38 or 48 or maybe no. even 58 well so, we're going to York <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Sim Dogs are playing in New York next month oh we're going to York yeah. too yeah yeah <laughs> York, but, Detroit. Yeah, no, but it's uh, it's uh, it's great for me, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure talking about therapy, but there's nothing mm. like live performance and playing no. for 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 your personal um, well being. No, absolutely. And I think it's great the guys like us that have been doing it for how many years? Fifty two in my case. You probably yeah. got the same, yeah, yeah. if not longer. Yeah. yeah. Um, that we're still doing it and still have an audience because mm. we made our impressions through the early oh, days. Oh, actually, again, that's one of the reasons I did come back to playing because I had so much encouragement yes. and so much enthusiasm for, for fans, fans old and new, people that knew the bands that I'd played in. And, and 
and through the through the media and through Facebook and all that sort of stuff, I just kept getting such encouraging messages mm. of support that I just felt like I really kind of owe something to these people, mm. you know, to actually go out and try and get this together and perform and and and. Uh, and create some new music. And that was really all I was interested in doing, was to get some new music out as well. Mm-hmm. So that enthusiasm, that encouragement, that, that gives you that, that, that strength and that um, I've had confidence that, to go out and play again. You I know? have that same passion as well, to mm-hmm. do something creative from, from myself, mm-hmm. you know. Um, it never goes away. I'm Shouldn't also writing a book, which I've been yeah, doing for we're quite a few, few, few I've been working on it for a couple of years now, but it's, it's, uh, I'm starting to put it into context now. So I'm trying to aim for a point in the future where I can do it all at the same time. Wow. Hopefully get some tunes get out as well. Point, yeah. Maybe I even get this guy if he's not too busy to yeah, play, a, uh, play a bit of guitar. And yeah, like I can that. strum. Well, um, <clears throat> I was going to say, I messaged this morning out, posted saying, I've got Zalan's head on, any questions, let us know. Ooh, so lots oh, of right, people tricky. have been... Um, We've gone international. It's good. We've gone global. It's good, this. Um, so mm-hmm. on that note, somebody was actually asking, a couple of people have said, Will you guys ever perform together again, Zal and Ted? So I would. Uh, anytime. I'd have. I'd already. Um, anytime. Um, spoken to Zal about a project that I'm in, involved in. Um, so yes, I'd, I'd love to work because I know the ways Zal does his thing, and I've never. It's like there's Zal and I have never had any problem playing together. Even, we usually play on our own, and we don't even have, we don't have to count it, and we just play. Yeah. And, and and I can understand where he's going with his stuff because it's and that's yeah. one of the great things about musicianship and um, yeah sure that would be, be great yeah, to, to yeah. do something in the future but you know obviously we're all doing just things but yeah this is, uh, any any project that comes up Ted and I could, could you know if people want us to be involved in something then yeah we can that's the second half the guys are available we are available them, you know, yeah, yeah. message them like, I'll get an agency fee for that I'll, start, I'll negotiate mm-hmm. that cool. um, so yeah a lot of people posting online so I'm just going to sift through as best I possibly can a great reaction as per usual which is absolutely well it's very very encouraging um, now there was one that drew, uh, that captured my attention earlier relating to yourself Sal mm. it was getting at the fact it was sold on a weed at verbatim because this man was a big fan of yours Um Sorry for the delay here, guys. Sorry for the delay. This is no. such a big reaction. These are famous. He's plowing fun. through them, folks. Right, okay. Who, from William McGee, maybe a bit boring, he says, but who inspired Zal to play the way that he does? Is there any way that you can pinpoint? Because your style is very unique, as we all have, have glorified. It is a hand. hybrid style, I have to say. I mean, I have lots of guitar heroes, obviously, of, of that. But when I, first, when I first heard music, and I first heard guitar music, it was that rockabilly era, that kind of sound. And it was just the sound of that guitar to me was like, wow, that, you know what is it? And then Chuck, of course, Chuck Berry, who's like the godfather of probably every rock riff that's ever mm. been written. Rock music wouldn't be it wouldn't exist without Chuck Berry. It's because every band plays that shape. They mm. play those shapes all the time. They play those chords, that 12 bars, if, it's, that's, if that's what it is. But, so it all grew from there. And um, in terms of identifying a, a, a personal style, I, apart from listening to that kind of music, I'd listened to uh, a jazz guitar player called Wes Montgomery and another one called Kenny Burrell. Um, and I was only about 15 or what, 14, 15 at that time, and I could hear this sound that these guys made. Uh, Wes Montgomery playing octaves, playing using octaves, and I thought, what is that? How is he doing that? What, what's, what's creating that sound? Because it just sounded w- wonderful. And I figured out that that's what he was playing. He was playing things in octaves, and then he was playing, you know, different time fields and, and stuff. And and there was, there didn't seem in that jazz mode. There didn't seem to be too many rules. I could never see any rules in that kind of music. So every time I pick the guitar up, I tend to look away from the rules, mm. and I always I always step away from it. And rather than I was never one to sort of stick rigidly to to scaling and, and all that business. And, and then, of course, it, that progressed into the Frank Zappas and people like that. Once I, once I listened to Frank Zappa, I just knew there were, there were no rules, you know, and that was it, you know. You just, you play what you hear. You play basically what you hear in your head. I've, I've, quote, I've been quoted, actually, for saying, play what you hear in your head first and then worry about it later. <laughs> that's, that's a good, good mantra. Yeah. You see, when you're improvising, I, I heard that a lot of some of the blues guitarists do this. They sing the melody in their head. Yes, and play it. Yeah. Do you do I that? do that all the time. You do that? I do that all the time. Yeah, yeah, when I'm playing solos and stuff. That's because you're one of these... It's almost like ska, like, you know, right. like that ska style where you're sort of singing and playing the same thing. 
because it, I, it I tends always, to keep you in tune, I suppose. Or it's, it's, it feels like you're heading towards, towards a melody of some description, <laughs> but yeah. When you and I were talking years ago, but Zama, I think it was yourself that said um, about Clapton. It's great. It's Clapton, and we all love Clapton. I'm sure. Mm-hmm. You kind of know when he's going to go, when he's doing his improvising no, blues. But yeah. no, I mean the, the 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 jury is out. You couldn't if the bookies couldn't possibly <laughs> place bets on what note Zama's going to play well, next. I know, I know, I know. But the, but Clapton's very traditional in a sense. You know, he's traditional in the way that he he comes from right from the. The heart the of basics, the heart yeah. of how blues playing, and it's a that's a whole different thing, you know. <clears throat> I just get, I, I actually get, um, I'm just impatient. I think is, is is the answer to the to that to talk about that. That I, I hate playing the same thing twice, yeah. and when people say <laughs> that's to me, why I always speed up and slow down and, yeah, yeah. and play the wrong drum fill. I, like, I can't don't like to play it to make everybody else feel comfortable. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> throw it about a bit. But yeah, that whole idea of, of good re- repeating yourself mm-hmm. to me, you say, okay, I've played that once now. I'm like, you want me to play that again and again and again and again and again? No, no, no. I'll, let's, let's see if we can find something else to do with it. Like so, I said, absolutely brilliant reaction. And yeah. then here, Reg Richardson, does Zal still have his outfits from the Sab days? Um, and do they still fit? Oh, that's an old one, that. That's an old one. Uh, yeah, no, they don't they've been fit. been auctioned. They don't fit. Maybe they, because they've been auctioned. <laughs> yes, we had auctions for one or two. I had I had two different costumes, and the original one got auctioned, and it was modelled by a a twelve year old ballad ballerina, I think. So it fitted her okay. Um, so it, so yeah, it doesn't fit me. But I still actually have a copy of the original suit somewhere in an attic uh, that I think I could probably find. But, oh wow! Yeah, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. And it's very matte. It's matte. Don't forget. It's not shiny. It's matte. <laughs> Love that, it's a, it's a matte finish. Yeah. Um, Hoggy is on here um, asking, how old were you when you got your first guitar? What was that guitar? Is there a story behind it? Uh, it was a little Spanish guitar my folks bought me when I was about 14. Just a little acoustic Spanish, little Spanish guitar with gut strings and I just plonked on that. I strummed it to begin with. Mm-hmm. I see I had an ironing board at that point. Uh-huh. You told me this Because uh, I didn't get a drum kit until I was 16. See mm. there, so you, you have deprivation there. in the early yeah. at that time. Yeah. It was it was rife. Yeah, it, it's on fire through these. It all thanks so much for everybody for posting these. A fantastic reaction. If you notice, they're stalled earlier on because I couldn't believe it. The the, the, the amount of inundated. comments that we've had. Be inundated, inundated to say the least. Um, Mike Cobley, hope you're pron- pronouncing the name correct there, Mike. Um, essentially, he's asking, he was there at the gig last night in Trun. He was blown away. The band's brilliant. The Sin Dogs. Everybody check out the Sin Dogs. Um, is when is volume two coming out? It'll be next year before we get that done. But the songs are already in place. I would say more or less ready to go. So it's just a recording, more time to find to record basically. Nelson McFarlane, bass player and Hearts fan, extraordinarist, um, is asking Ted McKenna how many drummers has he taught? Because it seems that every drummer that he's ever spoken to at some point has had a lesson from Ted McKenna. Is, um, it, in the, is it in the thousands? I believe it could well be. Yeah, I mean, I, I did a lot of teaching uh, even before I was at the college. I used to teach privately, and of course, you were 12 when I taught you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Five years ago? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so um, it's it's hard to say because I taught when I was in, before I came back to Scotland as well. So, yeah, I've taught a lot of guys. I mean, I. Um, <clears throat> I've, I've intended to try and do some sort of online thing, uh, but I need help with that because I'm not, I'm not too au fait with getting things rolling. But I'd like to be able to do the basics with people, what I consider to be after fifty two years the important things that you must learn, regardless of what style you play, and just do them from whatever hotel room in whatever country I'm in. That would be <laughs> that would be ideal to do that. Cool. And I've actually made the first step of getting a little stand from a from a my, my phone so that I can go. Rat tat tat. Mm-hmm. But yeah. It's a tiny yeah. little drum kit, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. oh, the usual battered practice pad that I have on the road in me. Adam Banks is asking a good question, actually. Um, and just as a, a, a lead up to this, been fortunate enough to do um, on the last tour with Zal. Um, I noticed that so many people were coming up to you going, Zal, I love the four play album. Mm. So on that note, Adam Banks is asking, is there any plans to re release the four play album? Um, we'll, we'll do this as a two-parter because the second part is has Al ever met Richie Blackmore? Yeah, I've met Richie, Richie Blackmore. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I've yeah. played with him. 
Yeah. Well, we played him on it. Why that on the Deep this? Purple tour? Yeah, we played the Deep Purple. Yeah. We were up yeah, jamming. Yeah, Richie's nice guy. He played bass. Alex played guitar. Nice guy. But yeah. uh, foreplay, you were saying. Uh, well, I wouldn't have any clues about releasing anything. To be perfectly honest, I don't. Yeah. Really, I don't know what the business side of it that's uh, involved. I don't even know who owns it or. I don't. What label yeah, it's on? Or yeah. it's know. out there. People can buy it, but um, the thing is, if it's owned by uh, Universal, it must be owned by Universal. They, they, they must be leasing it. You know, which they can do because we don't own our own material. We don't. It was. Uh, that's a whole other story. It was story, stolen. But, uh, it was stolen from us essentially by somebody who worked. In the management company, so it was sold on to uh, West, uh, West, what's it called? West World. West, yeah. <laughs> yeah when, um, you Brenner's got it. There, when, there was another, it. another company, um, I forgot it's so long now, I can't remember, and they in turn sold it to Universal. Wicked Uni- nefarious people. Universal Germany, so we don't have any say in, in what happens to our material. That's the thing about it. Um, but there's we've a lot tried, of, we've tried over the there's years. There's a lot of things to talk about in that, that, that direction. But if they if they have that and it's out there, it's because they're releasing it because they own it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, it, but you know, you, the idea of releasing stuff's fine and dandy. But what is practical is another thing. You know. Mm-hmm. Well, okay. Well, listen. Zal said to me a week and two ago when I said, "Why don't we do an interview with Ted and Zal?" And you know yourself, and Ted, of course, is a duo. And Zal says, absolutely, we make a much better double act. Mm. And he was correct. Thank you very much for both coming we to the spark cruise. Each other. Yeah, yeah, we do. We spark each other off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Zal, if I could ask you to, to be so kind to play us out, pleasure with with anything of your choice, any key. Do you have a, a pledge? Do you have a pledge from around? Oh, do we have a pledge? Mm. We've got everything bar mm. pledge. This is this is this will be worth the pain. I thought you said there was some tune when you bought it. Yeah, it was. Is that? It's quite a small guitar, that, isn't it? Yeah. It's a small gauge, isn't it? Is that alright? There's all this fun. It's all pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> I remember, we used, to, we, used to, we used to work on songs at one point. I was using the acoustic and I've never heard that anybody could make an acoustic guitar sound like an electric guitar because it did Cause this it was, is a wee song I did from in Cyprus when I was practising some and living in Tavernas and stuff and it just I thought I'll write something that sounds a bit sort of separate and it goes like this Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching Ted and Zal on the Talk Music Podcast. Can you please let me know, can this be part one of two? We'll get you guys back. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wonderful. Absolutely. We'll be back. Plenty as more to talk about. Yep. Nice one. All the politics and all that Is that stuff. the camera there? Yes. Okay. It's good to know. Duty. Good to is know. the lighting all right? Ted looks yes, great. This is my, what angle is this? My angle here? Yeah. There's an angle. Let me get a pretty, my better side. Wow, 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 wow.